Hello and welcome to another episode of Press Play. I am your host, Derek Gerber, and we are so excited to have Tom Bancroft on the phone. Welcome to the show today, Tom. Please introduce yourself and tell the audience more about what you do for a living. Well, thank you, Derek. Uh, happy to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm Tom Bancroft, and mostly I'm known as an animator. So uh, uh, I've been in the animation industry for about 30 years now worked for many of the major studios, but primarily my start and, and about half of my career was about 12 years at Disney. And so I was there during the 90s and 2000s and animated on films like Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King, Pocahontas, Mulan, um, really kind of during the second golden age of animation there. And at the end there, I was able to uh, design and animate Mushu the Dragon. So I created Mushu for Mulan. Um, so lots of fun stories there and things that I learned. Um, and then I kind of took that um, and started my own company, the, my first of two companies. My first was Funny Pages Productions with a, a business partner from Disney. Uh, we kind of gotten together two artists and created our own company. We did a lot of illustration and character design and storyboards for a lot of the major studios on our own independently and um, <clears throat> ran that together for about seven years. I also was a, a co-art director of abcmouse.com. I'm kind of giving you everything. I'll make it shorter, sorry. Um, and then also worked at Big Idea Productions and helped the, uh, direct uh, for a couple years uh, their 2D animated um, uh, Larry Boy 2D Adventures. Um, oh yeah, oh and, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the five or so video DVDs of that back in the day. Um, and now I've started my own company, and we'll probably talk more about that, but it's called Pencilish Animation Studios. It is the first crowd-invested animation studio. Oh, you're going to have to break that down for me. The crowd-invested animation studio part sounds very interesting to me. And I got to yeah. say, <laughs> you've obviously brought joy to millions of people around the world with your artwork. So thank you for that as a, yeah, one artist great. to another. That's amazing, of well, course. Well, Derek, I was paid, so I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> but, and well. some, artists, some artists don't get paid for those things. Yeah. And so you've no. done it right, and you've done it well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, in, in the essence of everything, how you make people feel and bring these things to life no one can really say that they bring so many characters to life there's very few so thank you for that mm. um but you know just from the, from that uh, relationship side what is it like working with and adding value to brands like disney or creating these iconic characters in these worlds where they live on forever you know uh, even at disney um i guess we didn't know how big of an impact we were making it's kind of one of those hindsight things um, because before that, uh, you know, the, the first golden age was ba way back in the fifties. And so, uh, Disney was sort of trugging along for a while there. Most, most people listening to this podcast don't realize that, but in the eighties and seventies before that, um, back when I was going to school in the mid eighties, uh, at Cal arts, um, they, they weren't doing so hot. And so I just happened to be on there when they really hit. Uh, this huge, and this was pre Pixar too, um, and hit this huge second uh, kind of run right before Pixar uh, was created and kind of helped destroy them <laughs> by accident. They didn't mean to, um, but it was computer animation that kind of took over 2D animation, hand drawn animation. And so, uh, but yeah, really, th it's so exciting to me and strange to still to this degree to this day to see that the, these young kids come up to me still and say, oh, thank you, I love Beauty and the Beast. My, my mom, who, who grew up with it, shows it to me because she loved it so much. And they, they get to share that moment now. I love that, you know, how many movies can you think of when you're a kid that are still around today that people know about them? It's, it's a very rare occurrence. And so for me to say that I have like five, six movies that people still really remember, is kind of amazing at my age. So anyway, I'm thrilled. <laughs> well, you know, and you make me think about it. It's like you were working on greatness before you even knew. Was there, I mean, beyond normal job pressure, but you know, was there a certain level of pressure to create the next big thing? Because like in 2021, 20, 22, whatever happens in the next five years in the metaverse, there's always a pressure to create the next big thing. Did you feel that at the time? Or did you kind of have a lot of uh, artistic freedom in your work? It was both. So um, I would say at the beginning, Disney had low expectations because they were coming out of this, this, uh, you know, goalie that they were in, which we'll call, you know, Great Mouse Detective and 
rescuers down under and then um and uh and then finally they made uh beauty and the beast and got you know there was a big jump but not till lion king did they start making like a billion dollars on a movie right and so that one really turned it around they'd made about three times as much i will say uh on lion king as they had any other film and so once that happened then the pressure really kind of came on because now they had expectations they had shareholders that had expectations of like okay every movie from here on out is going to be lion king and we never i will say this we never quite hit lion king after that but the pressure was there and and really i think the downfall both the the height of 2d animation and the downfall of 2d animation ironically is lion king because lion king set this bar impossible bar let's put it that way and not for quality i think we hit the quality level um, on many of the films they all look as good or even better than lion king but numbers wise they just whatever magic was there and the magic timing and and but also the visuals and the story and the music of lion king um because what happened with lion king is people were going not just kids anymore their parents were going and talking about it like teens were doing as a date night movie uh you know that they would never do an animated film for a date night movie now they were starting to do that because they were hearing such like like the movie titanic you know they were hearing that kind of buzz for this anim disney animated movie that we just never hit that level before that um and it, you know it helped Poca it helped pocahontas the movie right after it and it helped you know even hunchback in notre dame um you know but it started to die off. And now there were some great films after that, like Lilo and Stitch, Mulan, um, you know, that are, that are still living today and, and did quite well. It's just, I'm saying they didn't hit the, those numbers of Lion King. And so um, Disney is a corporation. And so, yeah, their expectations were, and so as things started to dwindle and it was more after Mulan, um, when you got into um, some of those other films after that, they just, and then meanwhile, Pixar starts taking off and everything they were doing was a huge hit. They just said, oh, I guess 2D's over. So it, yeah, it's Lion King, pro and con Lion King. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know I've got a special place for Lilo and Stitch in my mind. So that one's a cool one to, to hear in the mix. But um, I, I can totally see that. And I understand, uh, you know, along that journey, how that, that pressure may have evolved or changed within itself from a business aspect. You know, mm -hmm. but from the audience, what I loved hearing was just, you know, it was genuine creativity at the time, just looking for that new height. And like, that's really exciting to chase at the same time. So I get yeah. it. Once you, once you, you know, hit, hit a home run, you got to go hit another home run. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Maybe, I mean, you know, it's that more. one hit wonder on the music side of things, too, or you have a hit song and now everybody or a hit album, even worse. <laughs> and now everybody wants the next whole album to be amazing. Um, and maybe we're not quite in that world as much as we used to be in the 70s and 80s and stuff. But anyway, that's <laughs> well, what Disney went through. Quite the journey, quite the experiences. I could talk to you for a long time. But let me ask you more about Pencilish. Now, you the words that caught my mind uh, there were, were, were crowdfunding. And I'm used to technology and software in my background with workflow automation and a bunch of other nerdy terms. But really, when it comes to crowdfunding for animation, you got to break that down for me. How does that work? And, you know, walk me through that process so we can understand it better. Yeah. So um, I've learned a lot. And um, w what happened was I was going along with my life and going, but at the same time, like loving, you know, what I was doing and, and in every phase, there was a new challenge and every new job. And, but always in the back of my mind from when I first started in this industry, I wanted to be a creator. And here I was working on amazing films and certainly no regrets there. But I was also developing little TV shows and, and film pitches for future films and things like that of my dream projects. And it hit me around age 48 or 49 that, oh my gosh, I'm kind of getting older now. And so what am I going to do? Why am, and so I upped, I upped that Annie. I, I actually started creating like 10 different TV shows and, and uh, like three different feature films all the way to script. Uh, I put in some real effort for a couple of years there. And once that was over again, now then I'm about 51 or so. I'm like, okay, now what do I do with all this? I've created all this content and really as you know it, with any company but uh, but well before it's a company with any artist let's put it that way creator 
that roadblock is, okay, I need money to go to the next phase. I can do a lot on my own, and I had. I developed characters and things like that. But now I was like, okay, I'm in that same spot as everybody else. Even with my experience, I'm still in that same spot of how do I, I I'm not going to just pull it out of our house and sacrifice, you know, my family to do this dream project. Um, I need, you know, a few million dollars to really kind of launch into this. And so right about that time, again, this was right in the middle of COVID. So this was like about 20, summer of 2020. Uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, who owns a, a marketing firm um, at, here in Nashville, Tennessee, um, uh, and has lots of great connections and stuff, and is really kind of a futurist. He's always kind of looking forward. He throws at me this idea. He's like, Tom, I just did this project with a, a I'm a partner in another company, and we did a crowd investment. And, and the more that I've learned about it, I really think this is perfect for you. And so I'm, I'm, whenever I tell the stories, I give credit to Ash Grayson for this because he's the one that kind of approached me. Now, was it the perfect fit? Yes. I mean, it, it kind of checked all the boxes. This was the thing I was looking for. And by the way, I already knew about it. I've been on my own researching. I'm very entrepreneurial. And so I knew about crowd uh, investment um, because there was a company that was the first feature film crowd investment. It's called Legion M. Many people probably have heard of that uh, listening to this, and they've raised over 25 million or something with many different um, uh, crowd uh, raises. And so what? Uh, here's the short of it. So what it is, is it's like a Kickstarter. We already had Kickstarter, and I've done four of those, by the way, successfully. Um, so I knew that world, um, and I love the idea. Um, this is why it all kind of fit for me. I, I have a large following on Instagram, about, I don't know, 320, uh, thousand, 320,000. Anyway, so, um, uh, I, I, I've been doing teaching and a lot of in, things like that. I've, I've started my own teaching kind of online things. And so what this was, was a way for me to kind of go directly to my audience and say, Hey, what if, and I'll get to what, what a reg reg CF is, but I, you can now go to a, uh, and start a company. This is, again, uh, upscale from a Kickstarter. This is more like how do you kickstart a company, and that's called a Regulation CF. It, it started about six years ago, I think during the Obama in, in administration th through the JOBS Act, and it's only gotten better. Uh, uh, Trump actually enlarged uh, the amount you can raise. It used to be a, a million point three or something was the top you could raise. Now it's uh, five million and above, um, and so anyway, uh, the nice thing is is that you can really start a company, and what it is is it's a way for a start a startup to get the average person to invest in their company. Now you can invest as low as a hundred dollars and be an investor in a company, and that's what this is. And so there's many websites that have popped up that are sort of the kickstarters that are utilizing this reg cf and saying we're going to have a website where you can kind of go and and send all your people to um we'll handle the contract stuff on the back end the, the shareholder contracts and things like that there's a lot of legalese this is this is not just kickstarted i want to make that clear this is a much heavier um and you can go to jail too it's fcc regulated so if i screwed up anything uh there's definitely consequences it's not just like I've done a book on Kickstarter and if I didn't send you that book, you're going to be upset and give me a bad review. This, there's much higher stakes here, uh, but off, obviously a lot higher uh, potential to get the kind of funding uh, to, to actually start a company. So we were able to raise in about eight months uh, $2.3 million. We just finished our, on Halloween night, we finished our, our first raise uh, and we have 4,500 investors, over 4,500. Um, so the beautiful thing, and, and if you know marketing at all, this is more my my buddy Ash Grayson, is we also now have an army. We not only got them to invest and help us get going, but we have this army of shareholders that hopefully are not only fans of me or, or animation, but of this company that they now co-own with us. And so they want it to succeed so on the marketing side, and I don't want to be crass, but obviously they're going to be passionate about whatever we put out, I hope, because <laughs> they, they have a vested interest. 
And so um, we try and keep them very involved in it too. And so while a lot of companies, the Pixars and the Disneys and stuff like that, and even the, the Cartoon Networks and, and Nickelodeons, they like to keep everything really close to their chest. They don't want to, for marketing reasons and for people sort of stealing their ideas or whatever, who knows why, they still believe in the old internet, which was we don't tell anybody anything until it's ready to launch and we get this amazing trailer out there and that's when they get excited. Nope, that's not what we're doing. We're taking you on the road with us. We want you to, from day one, to know, hey, we just signed this agreement with this creator. We're going to make this show. We don't have any designs to tell you, but we're going to get you excited about what the idea is. And by the way, that idea might change a little bit, but we're going to tell you about, about it. This is why we like it. And then we're going to start showing you designs. And so we have behind the scenes uh, videos uh, on our YouTube channel, Pencilish Studios, that is us for like just speed drawing about here's me designing characters for Juju Brain, one of our shows. Here's me designing. And then our other artists, our animators. Here's an animator talking about how they animated a, a test shot for this this show. So that's what I mean is crowd investment to me is you're taking the whole crowd with you. And, it, and I'm, I'm passionate about it. I really want them to feel involved because they have a personal stake in what we're doing. And I got to say, one of the reasons that, you know, we're even bringing this up is because you're building that engagement and building those relationships in a way that hasn't been done, which is trending with new best practices. And that's the point is that we're breaking new models every single day from the technology we use to capture and deploy animation. Also now into how we communicate with people and bring the everyday person into the job. I think that's how you create some cult classics. And that's what gets me really excited between, you know, your partnership here and you have all these different things going on. So I got to say, uh, what what are, what are some of the shows or maybe some of the projects that we could recognize if we're out there in the wild and looking for things? Like, what what are, what are some things you can get us excited about here for a couple seconds? Well, yeah, <laughs> so nothing's been uh, officially, you know, as I said, we just finished raising all of our money, but we did start as soon as we had <clears throat> enough to go, okay, we're viable. About, a, at a, like, say, when we were raising maybe around the million-dollar uh, mark, we're like, okay, we're going to do this. There's no way we're turning back. And so we started. And so I immediately started hiring a couple people. And so now we have up to six employees. Um, and all a couple of them are animators, some of them are artists, some of them are more on the production and producing side. Um, and we started making deals. And so I one of the shows is Bjorn the Last Unicorn. And it's this, I'll, t I'll pitch the story. So it's all about uh, a unicorn. It's the last unicorn in the world. He's been hiding up in the uh, Scandinavia mountains in a cave, afraid of, you know, all the people that basically have terminated all the other unicorns that ever lived. And so he's, that's why he's the last one. He's been in hiding. He finally decides, no, I'm bored. I want to leave this thing. I'm going to go out and venture into the world. And it's right as he finds a cell phone, uh, one of the, cli <laughs> the alpine climbers drops it and so he's able to get it and he discovers the world of the internet and so this show is all about social media and uh, both making fun of and embracing the world we live in social media uh, when bjorn comes down from the mountain and actually meets a social media influencer like a momager basically somebody that manages these people he falls in love with becca they and not in love but they're best friends she, he moves in with her and becomes her one of her pets and so Bjorn, who can who can talk, and he's again the last unicorn, and uh, by the way, adorable, really cute. He obviously they put up their first post, and he, overnight he's just like in the real world, a, a talking cute unicorn that all of a sudden exists is going to be the number one pet influencer of all time. He takes that job immediately, and who else lives in the house with Becca? She was already the momager for Patty this cat so who does a lot of prat falls and it's just a cute fat cat and so patty was the number one and now living in the house with her is this new number one pet influencer so there's a war already going on in the household between patty and bjorn bjorn is super naive he just loves everybody uh he's one of these much like olaf or something like that he just loves everybody and doesn't see the negative side of the internet either. He just uh, blindly goes in thinking that as a social media influencer, you must be the kind of person that uh, wants to just hug the world. And that's his goal. So I think that's a fun project. The, the second one we have, uh, and that'll be coming out, all of these are gonna start premiering in short form um, on our YouTube channel 
uh, around March-ish. Um, and so uh, the other one is called Mind Over Murphy. And this is about, uh, I contacted a, a stand-up comedian, uh, kind of skit guy that was doing skits on Instagram, uh, Max St. John, and who's gotten quite a following. Um, and I loved his skits. And I, I was like, to me, this is SNL, but now on Instagram. And he was doing them all really short, of course, for Instagram. And so I approached him and said, let's make a show together. And it's basically going to be called Mind Over Murphy. And you're going to be Murphy, basically. It's about him, basically. But now we call him Murphy, not Max. And it's about a guy that lives in New York and is in his you know, mid-20s, still trying to discover what life is about and where he belongs. And so this is really suited for an older audience. Um, but he can now he can see his brain. He has such a high level of anxiety that his brain literally uh, floats next to him and has a personality. And so he nobody else can see him, but he can talk to his brain and uh, brain uh, hurts him more than he helps him. He basically it's like he takes every stress or anxiety he has and times is it by 10. You know? So if Murphy feels like a little bump on his neck and he's like, oh, gee, I think I've got a cyst or something you know, brain is going to do what your brain would do, which is, oh, wait, you got to go to the doctor right now. That's cancer. That's a lymph node, whatever. And so he's constantly like throwing him into panic mode, but in a very fun and funny way. Um, and so I really kind of feel like that show is, it's a, it's kind of a buddy show, um, but with himself <laughs> and, and the brain, which has a totally different personality. This is amazing. No, and all this behind the scenes, these characters, these things come into life. I got to say, what sets Pencilish apart from the other big name studios out there? And how do you hope to disrupt the animation industry as you're gaining a, gaining a lot of momentum, of course, but exploring new projects and things like that along the way? You know, I call us an animation revolution. I've been doing this all through our WeFunder and saying that we're creating an animation revolution. In some ways, and I admit this to everybody, is I'm hoping what we're doing is we're not so original. We are taking from Disney, my years at Disney, and but we're taking the good stuff and saying, okay, they knew marketing. They look, Let's not ignore that. We have a marketing partner in this company. So we're gonna put marketing money into what we launch on YouTube, unlike everybody else that just throws it up and hopes it goes, you know, goes big uh, and goes viral. We're gonna market it. We want people to see it. I mean, that just makes sense, right? Um, and so we are going to take some things that I learned from Disney, of course. Um, we're going to try and we're going to reach for, well, I have a, a huge uh, contact sheet of all the people that I've worked through, with through 30 years. So we're going to work with some of the best talents. And But we're also going to work with, I also am an instructor at, in Nashville here at Lipscomb University and started the animation program there. Um, and so we're going to tap the next generation too. And this is part of the revolution side is we're going to start teaming up masters of the craft with newbies that are just really talented and create shows with that combination. We have we're going to be mentoring this next generation while we make shows. And I'm super excited about that aspect of it, too. So, um, oh, and then meanwhile, we're going to do something that Disney and Network Netflix and all the other big animation studios uh, don't do which is they don't take the creators along for the ride. Um, I don't know if you know this, but most really popular animated shows out there, um, we'll say, I don't know, Steven Universe or something like that, they basically are just acquiring that from that creator. Now, best case scenario, that creator that pitched them that idea gets to be connected to it and help make that show. Uh, but that's not necessarily right the 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 truth sometimes they just acquire the the content and they you don't have that much experience in animation and so therefore they're like thank you for your idea and we're gonna license it for a couple of years and basically tie it up and never make that show and those deals happen every day um and so the creator basically is is can't make their their own show they're waiting for that disney or that netflix to make it and meanwhile time goes by they give it back to them yes eventually it reverts back but now it's it's old and, and disney passed on it and now it doesn't look so shiny to other studios and so that's a negative and they gave you a dime on the dollar i mean like that deal was very small um and then meanwhile also if you work for a studio and this is how the studios mine most of their uh talent is 
oh, you're a storyboard uh, artist on SpongeBob and you're really talented, maybe moved into directing. Hey, do you have any ideas for your own show? Oh, that's great, right? Creators love that. But <clears throat> then they pitch that show and now that company owns it. And at best, like I said, you get a directing gig out of it for a couple of years and you help to make them a lot of money. Uh, while you make, yes, a good income, but you don't see any of the back end. You don't get the merchandising and the marketing. And by the way, here's the, the, the dirty little secret of the animation uh, industry is that animation is kind of a break even kind of a, of a job. So not job, but a, of a venture in that you have, it takes time. You have to put a lot of money into it. There's a lot of time and development that goes into it. And so when you get even a popular show, oftentimes can be a pretty break even kind of a situation. The real money in animation is having a popular character and stories that people love and now they want to buy the merchandise from. And the merchandising and licensing opportunities are what the big corporations have been getting almost all of, right? And that's where almost all the money is. Uh, you know, and you, that part makes sense. And we acknowledge that part for sure. And I love that, you know, from, uh, you know, shows like Rick and Morty, how they directly acknowledge <laughs> the humor in some of these things. And they're supported by that huge, strong, cold fan base, always asking for the next season, which could be any length of time away. So joking through all that and all that aside, what would you think right now? I mean, in the evolution of technology, as we discussed, um, you know, working to create the next big home run all the time from, from the big dogs and then how these contracts actually work on the back end. What do you think is going to be the next evolution of animation? Is it more crowdfunded projects? Is it something to do inside the metaverse or, you know, artists properly making more money from the NFT world and blockchain technologies around them? Like, how would you wrap all these things up for the audience to, to keep their eyes on for the next couple of years? Well, and, yeah. And so if people are watching the video version of this and they see what I look like, don't get too scared. This is an old guy telling you, I love where things are headed. I think that things like NFTs, while there's certainly many negative things, and I think a lot of that is starting to get cleared up as far as the, the uh, ecology side of things. Uh, um, um, they're making them more efficient and not burning the energy they used to. But nowadays you can make a NFT that you know, is equal to a tweet as far as how much uh, energy it takes. Um, uh, while, while that's getting fixed, finally, um, what, what, what I want to see is people starting to realize, and I'm talking about the artists, is that this is a new way for me to create digital concepts, basically digital art that I never had a revenue stream from. Like you can't sell digital art before NFTs because it's digital. Like the people want original art. Sure, you can sell that. But we all draw digitally nowadays for a lot of good reasons. And, um, but now there's, here's a way to monetize that digital art as an original piece. And that is hugely valuable to artists. And, I, and I, it's, it surprises me to see so many artists are so negative toward NFTs. And I get some of the reasons. The, the, the first people in weren't necessarily the best artists. They're, they're, they look at it as a cheap money grab and all that. But what it's going to evolve into is, a, is I hope, um, a real way for artists to monetize, find a new monetization stream for their work. And good golly, we should be getting onto that and helping make that evolve in the right way. Artists need to be involved, involved in where NFTs are headed or they're not going to head in the way we want them to head, right? It's going to be businessmen driving it. And so we need some smart artists getting involved in that. Um, and creators. Uh, and so what we're going to see, what's happening now in NFTs is the ugly side, mostly. What we're about to see, I think, is real creatives coming in and making things that make sense, but also are beautiful and have great ideas behind them. That's what we're missing because business people are, are leading it right now and it's, it's ugly. So um, that said, um, uh, yeah, I do think that we're going to see, we're already seeing it in media. So like um, the Netflix is right. That started this whole thing and that the network's going away, right? The ABCs, the NBCs and all that, that's already, <laughs> I hate to say it, dead to me. Like I don't see anybody watching cable TV unless they're watching it um, for a sporting event or something like that. Um, Right. There's it's very rare that you see. So how we all are starting to view our even our network television to television stuff is through a streamer. It's either that network streamer now 
and we're not watching it via cable. Um, and so like we cut our cable, you know, uh, a year or two ago and we don't miss it a bit. <laughs> so, um, but with YouTube red, we can still obtain some of those news channels and things like that. So, um, it's just like, if it's shocking to me that we're still seeing so many people try and make the old style work, they're still doing, I don't know, commercials in the same way they used to do it and things like that. And people are like, wait, I have to advertise on the internet for my movie. I that like what that, that was five years ago. Yeah. That that's already happening. So I am not that guy. I, I love to look forward. And I'm, that's also why I feel like we're making animation, uh, uh, revolution is that we're not, we're not looking at the old ways. I don't, I almost don't care that we, that Netflix wants to pick up our show or something like that. I mean, yeah, there's some sides to that that could be financially viable, but really I'm looking for what's going to happen in the next two, five years. Um, and what those streams are, you know, OTTs and things like that, um, are going to be brand new ways that we can get content out there that are cutting out some of the middlemen. And that's, that's what we're talking about is cutting out middlemen nowadays and going direct to our audience. And we can do that yes. now because guess what? We all have a distribution system in our hands <laughs> and it's in our pocket <laughs> all day long. Why can't we you, go you direct? You couldn't have nailed that any better. I mean, technology is really bringing to life the creative aspects that have sometimes been underground or in the shadows at times. And now it's literally being brought to life. And I think when you have that adoption curve of new technology, you're going to get all the quick first movers first and you have a platform mm -hmm. to talk about it. So. It's all the buzz. I think also in the next two to five years, you're going to see a huge refinement of the bigger players stepping up, the the bigger brands, true artists that are going to create those things that are beautiful and then they matter. That's going to provide the most value. And how it all comes together, who knows? I guess that's a part of the journey. I heard from yeah. someone much smarter than me. Life is not short. Life is long. You just need to enjoy the journey along the way. So if you think mm -hmm. about it that way, technology is, is moving very rapidly. And we could see anything come out in the next six months, six years and it'd be exciting. So I yeah. got to say, what's what's next for you and Pencilish? And of course, how can the audience follow along uh, and stay in touch with you? And you, you got you to fill us in on those things too. Oh, yeah. So what's next? Um, I want to do a feature film. I'm going to be bold and throw it out there. We're pretty early to say that, obviously, but I want that to be out there that this is our goal because I'm a feature film guy. I love TV animation. I love creating characters and telling stories. And we're launching with what's going to be a quicker return on investment for our shareholders, which is a TV style production. We can make, and we're making them short form, by the way, they're all five minute long episodes. So very viewable on your phone. We're embracing that. Um, and yet still long enough and sequential too, by the way, we'll put out at least five episodes as a sort of a mini season one. Um, so you'll get to know the story and the characters and, and we want you to fall in love with those. So that's phase one. Uh, phase two is, could involve more NFTs and could involve, uh, things like that. And that may help us launch. I have, and I can't mention it right now because some, I want to be the first one out, but I have a way I think to create, a, a, a feature film that might involve NFTs. And so I really am excited about that and kind of seeing where that get leads. And obviously we, we need a little bit more research, uh, to, to be even the front runner in that, um, but uh, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, we have two more shows that we're in development with right now with a, um, and then we're gonna also hopefully get involved with YouTube doing some, um, some short form, more skit based kind of animation uh, that I'm also excited about, uh, part of their shorts program. Um, and so that's another goal of mine too. Uh, in, in the more, uh, you know, just recent, uh, the next year or so. so yeah, I don't know. Uh, is that enough? I, I have a lot more ideas, but uh, I don't you are a very busy yeah. person and we love it. So we have to stay yeah. so we can follow you on Instagram, on YouTube, on the on the website. You mentioned some materials, any other places for the audience that we definitely want to tag along on your journey? With? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So for sure, for Pencilish, we have a, a you know, we have our Instagram page, Pencilish uh, Studios, and we have um, the Pencilish Studios on uh, YouTube, of course, and that's where you can now see a lot of our, um, our um, talks with, uh, I call them drawn talks, and they were for while we were raising, but basically it was a way for us to kind of get the word out. 
and we would talk to the creators of all three shows that we're doing right now. We would talk to a lot of the voice talent. We have, by the way, I didn't mention this, but we're tapping TikTok and YouTubers as voice talent, um, which I know we didn't create that, but I think we're creating it in a new way in that we're making them animated characters in our shows because they are super talented. I'm not talking about the dance people. I'm talking about there's so many people that are on TikTok and YouTube that actually are creating really good skits and really talented uh, actors. And so we've tapped some of those that have never done, had that opportunity to do an animated voice. And so each one of our people, like Chris Collins does uh, one of our voices in one, and she just came out in the Forbes 30 for 30, uh, 30, 30 under 30. That's right, she's on that list. Um, and she's doing voices for one of our shows. Um, Bjorn the last unicorn uh so that show especially is about social media so we thought you know this is going to be a fun angle to have tap into voice actors that have never done it before but are just super talented and we're finding those on youtube and tiktok so yeah pencilish studios on youtube please follow that i have tom bancroft one the number one on instagram and so i have a large following for more of my sort of geeky fun drawings I do uh, there and I'll talk about pencilish from time to time too but that's my personal one uh, so those are the the two big ones and then the last one would be I actually have a podcast so I have a twin brother uh, Tony Bancroft we've been in the animation both of us for 30 years um, and we both were supervising animators at Disney he created Pumbaa um, and Kronk, um, and, and then we both animated on, I don't know, eight different feature films for Disney. So between the two of us, we probably in some way kind of helped define your childhood, I'm guessing. <laughs> so uh, follow that. So that's called the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast. That is amazing. And thank you. Yes, you have helped define my own childhood. <laughs> I was in the right generation slot for all those coming through. I am your demographic and I love it. It's it, it animation is ageless and it's timeless and it's forever going to hold a spot in time in our hearts. So thank you for that and, and all of your efforts. It's really exciting to have you on the show. And thanks again for being here. Oh, well, thank you, Derek. I appreciate it. All right. And for the audience, make sure you follow Tom on his journey, but also make sure that you're following the Press Play podcast. Like, share, subscribe, send it to your friends, do what you need to do. We love having you here. And again, thank you. I've been your host, Derek Gerber, and we will talk to you soon. Bye.